roaring waterfall. And one of them says, that's pretty. And the other one actually rejects that. He says, no, it's sublime. Now, who can tell me what sublime means? Anybody know? It's one of those words. Yeah? No. Mm -mm. No, that's, well, that's how we usually think of it. I mean, I get that. Uh -huh. Yeah, in a very small Exactly. Yes, that's it. It has, it has to do with awesomeness. That is awfulness, right? It, something, if something is sublime, it's wild and much bigger than you are and threatening even and, and makes you feel small, makes you feel humble before it. Like, I love thunderstorms. Do you like thunderstorms? I just, as long as I'm inside and safe, you know. But I love the sound of them. They go, <laughs> and the windows rattle, and the, you know, and the ground shakes and all that. I love that. That's sublimity. That's sublimeness. Something that's so much bigger than you that you couldn't possibly stop it if you wanted to, you know. It's overwhelming. Well, it has the ability, like you say, of, of tuning you to God. Go, oh, wow, you are great, God. There's a, there's a line at the end of um, chapter 28 of Job where the line is, um, the fear of the Lord is wisdom. There's another spot where, I think it's in Ecclesiastes, where the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But this said, the fear of the Lord is wisdom. And when it says fear, it's talking about that kind of sublimeness, that kind of awestruck all-encompassing, all-powerful kind of thing. Well, these two guys are standing in front of this waterfall, see? And one of them says, that's pretty, and the other one says, no. Now, how can you say no when somebody says, that's pretty? Who, how can you? It's like saying, um, I really like this. And the other guy says, no, you don't. <laughs> I do. <laughs> no, you don't. Well, you can't say no, right? Well, that's just what he says. Why is the question. Why? How can he feel justified in saying, no, you've actually had the wrong response to that waterfall? The wrong response? How can you say? OK, well, here's how. He thinks that the waterfall actually deserves the, our awe, that it in and of itself, the way it is, requires that I give it a certain kind of respect. And to call it pretty is to say, basically, I like it. OK, well, you like it. Who cares? That's what he's saying. Who cares whether you like it or not? Doesn't make a difference whether you like it or not. What you really need to do is be awestruck by it, see? And if you're not feeling awestruck by it, there's something wrong with you. Now, that's a radically different approach to beauty, don't you think? That's, ra that's not how we think of it. Somebody comes to you and says, hey, this song is really good. You hear him saying, I, I like it, right? It's pretty. But you ought to be saying, what is good about it? In other words, that word good might apply to the objective side, right? The, the unity, proportion, and clarity of the object. So they, your question should be, I'll, I'll reserve judgment until you let me hear it, and I'll tell you whether it has the characteristics of beauty in it. And then I'll call it good. And if it doesn't, I won't. Wouldn't that be amazing? I teach art history a lot, uh, used to anyway. Well, I guess I still do, and, uh, uh, but in college. And uh, I used to tell my, my, my art appreciation class, uh, most people come into a class like this saying this sentence, I don't know art, but I know what I like. See? And I said, I would tell them, by the end of this class, my goal is to get you to reverse those two. That is to say, you know, now that I've taken this class, I'm not sure what I like, but I know art. Wouldn't that be great? Because then you're doing what education really is all about. What is education for? Is it to get a job? 
Is it to get into college so you can get a job? Is it to get good grades so that you can get into college to get a good job? Do you do your homework now because you want to get good grades so that you can get into a good college so you can, you see what I mean? Is that really where you're headed? I hope not. I hope not. It's hard to understand this at your age, I know, because there are, uh, there are other pressures on you. You have to do what's good uh, and, and obey your teachers and so on like that. And, and I think that's exactly what you need to do because they'll lead you in the right direction. But what you're actually aiming for is something else and what your teachers are aiming for is something else. And this, is, this is what they're aiming for. They're actually not aiming just to teach you the truth about things. They're actually interested in ordering your loves. They're interested in getting your heart to be attached to the right things to the right degree. Have you know that idea? Do you know about the ordo amoris? Have you heard of that before? Ordo amoris. Anybody read Augustine? Are you Augustine fans? Yes, some of you, good. Well, in the Confessions he talks about it, some other places too. He says, maybe it's in the City of God more than in the Confessions now I think about it, but anyway, Augustine says that your heart actually has attached itself to various things in various, to various degrees, you see. And what you need to do if you want to get right with God is to put those things in the right order and to be more attached to the things at the top of the list than you are at the bottom of the list. You want to order your loves. You want to put them in right order. A lot of times, I think moral questions come up uh, because we take two things that we ought to love to some degree and we pit them against each other. Either you can love this or you can love that. And a lot of times the, re the answer to that problem is you need to love this more than that, but you need to love that too. Okay, So the two things are in relationship to each other, higher and lower and so on. I love my son more than I love my dog. I really love my dog. <laughs> Okay, but not compared to my son. <laughs> There's an ordering to the loves. Now, what would happen if I put my dog ahead of my son in my heart? Hmm. Weird things would happen, first of all. My, <laughs> son, <laughs> my son would be a little confused, I think. But more than that, strangely enough, let me, I'll tell you what, let me use my wife as an example because it makes more uh, clear, a clearer distinction. Say I put my dog ahead of my wife, okay? That's a really bad idea. She hates when I do that. <laughs> no, I'm just, I never do. But my point is this. If I put the dog ahead of my wife, the dog would get affection that my wife should be getting, and I would be treating the dog maybe as a human being, right? But here's what's really bad for the dog. It's actually bad for the dog. Because if I have a good relationship with my wife and she's in the right spot in my heart, my household is going to run very smoothly, and that dog is going to be fed better. It's just his life is going to be a better life, okay? Because the two of us actually ha build a, a relationship that is healthy, you can see it even more, uh, this is absurd with my dog, but you can see it with my son, for example. If she and I have a good relationship, he benefits from it. If I put him ahead of her in my heart, then he gets undue attention and actually would be more spoiled and I ruin him. But I also ruin my relationship with my wife too, right? That's gonna mess that up. But what Lewis says is that if you don't have these things in the right order, you lose both of them. Not just lose one, you don't just put the wrong, if you put the second thing first, the way he puts it is, you'll lose the first thing because you put it out of order, but you lose the second thing too because the second thing depended on the first thing in order for, for it to be properly understood. If we were, we're, Christians are told to love, to, uh, to uh, uh, care for the garden, take care of the garden. And we're also told to love God. And if we decided that we would not bother loving God, but we would take care of the garden, things get out of hand. Things go wrong. We would give the garden a kind of love that it doesn't deserve. And the garden would suffer. Certainly our relationship with God would suffer, but the garden too would suffer because it's because of my relationship with God that I will, I'm wise enough to treat the garden the way it ought to be treated. See? I hope this makes sense. But this is what education is for. Education is to train your heart to love the right things. 
to learn to love those things that are worth loving. That's how it works. So be asking your teachers, in, in so many words, what is it that I'm supposed to love in this situation? What am I, when your math teacher gives you a math assignment, what am I supposed to love? When your art teacher gives you an art assignment, what is it I'm supposed to love? And, and go on and ask them that. If you don't see it right off the bat, ask them, tell them. I'm, where, where is the good here that I'm supposed to be getting, see? Because I want to attach my heart to those things that God says are worth being attached to. Is that good English? <laughs> you see what I mean? Okay. Any questions about that kind of idea about beauty? That beauty has two aspects to it, that it has an objective aspect and a subjective, and that those two things are in relationship, and that our sinfulness actually teaches us that our subjective appreciation is all we need. That's all we need. We're going to listen to our preferences, and we're going to make our preferences sacrosanct, that they can't be violated, they can't be changed. My loves are what my loves are. Don't try and rearrange them for me. You see? And I think, I think what it means to be submitted to God is, first of all, that we love his truth and we love his goodness, but we also love his beauty. And we're going to attach our hearts to those things that are beautiful in the way that he would like us do, to do more than the way I would like me to do. That's a, it's a willingness, in a sense, to be aesthetically humble or something. Aesthetic, it's an aesthetic humbleness, just like we need to have an, an epistemological humility. Epistemolo the three ideas, truth, goodness, and beauty, have three uh, subjects that, they, uh, that address them uh, in philosophy. The study of epistemology is the study of how we know what's true. The study of uh, ethics is how we know what's good. And the study of aesthetics is how we know what's beautiful. So, does that make sense? Any got, got questions about all that? You've been very patient. No? Come on. I'm a college professor. I can wait forever. <laughs> what do you think? Have you ever thought of it that way before? I know you've been hearing about it from your teachers, but have you thought about it in your heart that way? That maybe what I like the best isn't necessarily the best thing? It may be, it may be, but it might not be too. What kinds of things make you decide what to like and what not to like? How do you decide what radio preset buttons to put in your car or what, what, what music to listen to? How do you decide? Mm -hmm. um, that we tend to think that should be a, uh, a standard of beauty, and so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we would be more apt to say on the kind of say, if, if you agree with a certain way, you would somehow say, yes, I don't like that. <laughs> right, then, right. Then I think we really need to take him back, like, wow, it doesn't matter what I like. What's going on is he has told me that this is beautiful based on my external appearance, and the only option is I'm going to like it. Right. In fact, it's clear that if I don't like it, there's something wrong with me. I've got to adjust me to like it because it's the reality. Yeah, that's a great example. Yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. The, the revelation can't be argued with. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. John, you talk about a fallen beauty. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, right, right. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, I, I think I mentioned that, that beauty comes through the rose and not from it. But there's a story I think you're talking about from, I think it's C.S. Lewis uh, again, that says uh, a gardener was in his garden and he was working on his roses. And he's, he's so delighted by the beauty of these roses that he stops to pray. And he says, thank you, God, for the beauty of these roses. And God speaks back to him. And he says, you're welcome. First of all, I made him. I made him for you to, to appreciate. I made him for that reason. But then he says something interesting. He says, but just imagine an unfallen rose. Imagine how beautiful that would be. Because, you see, 
this, the fall has affected everything. It's damaged even the roses. They, they don't have the beauty that they once had. But one day you'll get to see them again. And then he said, and just imagine seeing an unfallen rose through unfallen eyes. Because you see, your eyes have been damaged too. And that'll be a great day. Is that the one you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love that little story. It'll be a great moment to be able to see rightly. Like Paul says, we see through a glass darkly. You know that line? One day we will see face to face. And, and the beauty of the rose will, will suddenly become something that you find fulfilled in the eyes of Jesus himself. You see? And then there's a wonderful moment in the end of, um, of Dante's uh, Paradiso where, um, where Dante has finally come to see God himself. And he looks up and he looks into the eyes of God and he says something like this. Once having looked into those eyes, there's never a reason to turn your eyes away again. Because everything, everything that has been attractive to you in life, everything is fulfilled there. Those were only reflections, even the most beautiful of things. You know, that time you saw the, the Alps or the Grand Canyon for the first time and your whole body just goes, wow. That's just an imitation. That's just a, that's just a reflection, you see of what you see there. And so, what, it's kind of like Dante was saying, once I'm looking that way, if something were to come into my peripheral vision, there's no reason to turn and look at it because it's just an imitation of that. That's where the, the real thing is, and this is just a reflection. Now, that may be a very glorious reflection, but still. So, it's that way. It's that, that the fulfillment of our desire for beauty is actually going to be in the person of God. And I think that's why we need to speak about God in this world in beautiful terms. That is, not just to teach people when we're evangelizing, for example. We don't want to just teach people about, the, about what's true about God. We do certainly want to speak about the, what's true. But we want to speak that truth in beauty. Let me give you an example quick before I play some music for you. And we need to, how, how do we do here, uh, Jared? It's quarter past nine, is it? Is that really? Quarter past nine, yeah. Okay, so should we take our break now? What do you think? Ten. Okay, okay. Let me take, tell you this quick story, and then I'll let you go for five minutes. How about that? You can stretch your legs. Um, what was I talking about? Shoot, I've lost my track. What was it? Well, maybe we should take a break now. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot what I was going to say. It was a great old story I was going to tell you. Oh, it'll come to me in a minute. Why don't you take your break now, and I'll see you in five minutes. How about? <laughs>